welcome uh, this morning to our public forum on ASEAN communities here. Now what? Let us first uh, have opening remarks from the Dean of the Faculty, uh, the Dean of the Faculty of, of Political Science at Yulan Kwan University, Dr. A. Thanks for the Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, good morning and warm welcome uh, to all of you. Uh, let me first welcome you back uh, to our uh, usual uh, seminar room here on the fourth floor uh, of uh, this building. Uh, believe it or not, uh, this building was gone through several months of renovation, but it was confined only to the pipeline system. Uh, so we cannot really see uh, the good change uh, around this building and this uh, uh, around this room uh, because they are behind the walls and above the ceiling. Nevertheless, it is good to be back uh, in our uh, seminar room here. Uh, it is not fancy, but it works for us, and I hope it will all uh, it will work for all of you. I see. Thailand's uh, public forum today is on uh, the ASEAN community is here. Now what? Uh, this self-evident title is provocative and challenging. We have heard so much about the ASEAN community, especially the ASEAN economic community. It all became official on 31st uh, December last year. And now we are supposed uh, to be in the midst of the ASEAN community. Yet, I don't feel it. I don't feel like I'm in any kind of uh, ASEAN community any more today than I was uh, last year. Do you feel like you are in the ASEAN community? We are certainly in ASEAN, but to what extent we are in a kind of an ASEAN community? I shall leave these questions to the speakers to enlighten us. It is a cliche to say that the ASEAN community is a weak, uh, uh, is at, is a work in progress. It is there on paper, but still falls short in practice. I do think that the idea and the efforts behind the ASEAN community are more crucial now than ever. We can see mounting tensions in our neighborhoods from South China Sea to environmental impact. And we can see China's growing footprints and America's staying power. This week, Thailand hosts a crop grow military exercise Next week, the first ever ASEAN United States summit uh, will take place in California. In both events, the U.S. plays an instrumental role. Yet, China is the resident superpower, and where we are is China's backyard. So, whatever the gaps and shortcomings we have in the ASEAN community. We need to fix them because the ASEAN community is very much needed for the ASEAN member to maintain their centrality and relevance. ASEAN does not want to be dominated by either China or the US, and here is where the ASEAN community fits in. Without further ado, let me thank to the speakers for joining us today. His Excellency, Mr. Chakit uh, Sivali, uh, Director General uh, of Department of ASEAN Affairs, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, uh, Thailand. Uh, Assistant Professor Dr. Kitty Pasersuk, Director of Institute of ASEAN, uh, East ASEAN Studies, uh, from Thammasat University. Uh, Dr. Alexander Chandra, Associate Fellow at the Habibi Center, uh, Indonesia. Uh, Mr. Kawi Chongkit Tawon, our senior uh, fellow here. Uh, 
I want to uh, show some appreciation. To, uh, we're working with the Habibi Center from Jakarta, uh, and we have a number of uh, Habibi Center uh, officers here with us, and I will introduce them in a minute. Uh, they have been funded for this workshop uh, in a series of uh, Talking ASEANs, called Talking ASEANs. So they're going around different ASEAN countries to promote the ASEAN community. Uh, and here in Thailand, we are the local partner uh, the Habibi Center for this project is funded by the United States Agency for International Development. So I think that the AID, uh, USAID would like to say a, a few words. Uh, please. Uh, this is uh, uh, Rebecca Kuna, the ASEAN Program Manager for USAID Asia. Uh, it is my pleasure to be here at Chulalongkorn University and I would like to express my warmest welcome to all of you for joining us here today. On, the beh on behalf of the U.S. government, I'd like to thank the Habibi Center and the Institute of Strategic and International Studies of Chulalongkorn University for hosting this vitally important talking series, Public Discussion. This event provides an excellent forum to discuss thoughts about the possibilities to achieve our shared goals of a stable, politically cohesive, and economically integrated and socially responsible ASEAN community. The U.S. ASEAN relationship has expanded dramatically since our formal relations began in 1977. Following the United States' accession to the Treaty of Amity and cooperation in Southeast Asia in 2009, the U.S. was the first non-ASEAN country to appoint a resident ambassador to ASEAN in 2010. At the third U.S. ASEAN summit last November, the U.S. declared the elevation of this decades-long relationship to one of a strategic partnership dedicated to the success of ASEAN centrality, integration, and unity. The United States strongly believes that meaningful engagements and dialogues between civil society and ASEAN and decision makers are the bedrock of success for the implementation of the ASEAN Vision 2025. <clears throat> The United States has partnered with the Habibi Center to embark on a series of talking ASEAN discussions with ASEAN leaders and decision makers, civil society, think tanks, media, and other stakeholders across several ASEAN countries to delve deeper onto the issues that are important to you. This support is part of our commitment to supporting a civil society-centric platform upon which policymakers can interact with academia and media and others to promote inclusivity and further strengthen a partnership to support the ASEAN community that is built on a process that is people-oriented and people-centered. And as we work together in partnership through initiatives such as today's Talking ASEAN program, I believe that our shared goal, goals and common vision can be achieved. So I wish you all a very productive and invigorating discussion with today's distinguished visitors. Thank you. Excellencies, distinguished speakers, ladies and gentlemen, a very good morning. Let me at the very outset express, <coughs> express my appreciation to Dr. Titinan and the wonderful team at ISIS Thailand. Your support, cooperation, and in particular your patience were very instrumental in making this Talking ASEAN a uh, reality today. To Dr. Aki, uh, I would also like to say thank you for hosting our public discussion and also to USAID and the US Department of State for supporting this event. To our distinguished speakers, I am delighted you could join us. Let me pay particular tribute to His Excellency's uh, Ambassador Jack Reed. Uh, Your Excellency's presence here today is testament to the importance that Thailand attaches to the endeavor that is the ASEAN community. Last but not least, I would like to thank the audience for being with us today. As we all know, the ASEAN community requires, requires so much more than cooperation at the government-to-government -government level. It, it is only through the participation of all of us, businesses, academics, NGOs, media, and the youth, that we can develop a community that is truly people-orientated. <clears throat> Excellencies, distinguished speakers, ladies and gentlemen, allow me to explain how it is that the Habibi Center an Indonesian think tank is here in Thailand to discuss it about ASEAN. For those of you who may be unaware, our institution was established in 1999 by uh, Professor Dr. B.J. Habibi, the third president of the Republic of Indonesia, to continue the reforms that he had put in place when he was uh, president. 
taking a broad definition of what that entailed and realizing how these issues have become issues of regional concerns, the Habibi Center launched the ASEAN Studies Program in 2010. Through this program, the Habibi Center, alongside other institutions, working towards the same goal, such as ISIS Thailand, hope to contribute to the realization of a more people-orientated ASEAN. So over the past few years, we have been doing activities to this end, most notably through our Talking ASEAN event, which is held each month in Jakarta. More recently, the Habib Center ASEAN Studies Program has opened a new chapter as we embark on a Talking ASEAN Roadshow to take this formula uh, abroad to a wider audience in the region. As such, I am honored that we can be here today amongst our friends in Thailand to, to continue this exciting new chapter. I hope that by the end of today's event, we will strengthen dialogue between various stakeholders related to ASEAN and to have increased awareness, knowledge and a common understanding of regional priority issues to promote a more inclusive ASEAN Vision 2025. Thank you very much. I am very thankful. Uh, grateful to the speakers here. I think if you're in Thailand and you want to hear about ASEAN, you cannot have a, a more qualified uh, set of experts. Uh, the Director General of ASEAN, uh, he'll kick off. And then Kun uh, Kawi is also a distinguished speaker with us, a true expert on ASEAN, uh, Dr. Kitte. So these are the three top most experts you could have in Thailand to talk, to this, to talk about ASEAN in its various dimensions. I also want to thank my friend uh, Alex Chandra for coming here. Uh, as you know, ASEAN is going through a, uh, a profound shift. Uh, the neighborhood is different. We know that there are a lot rising tensions in the South China Sea. Uh, there is uh, some rivalry between the U.S. and China. A lot of cooperation between the U.S. and China, but I think through third parties, in the South China Sea, there's some tension. And ASEAN, uh, we know by, by heart now that it, it, uh, the ASEAN community comprises the political security community, economic community, socio-cultural community. And uh, since the end of last year, last December, we are supposed to have the ASEAN community. It's in effect. Uh, it doesn't feel like it, as uh, uh, Dr. Egg has mentioned, but yeah, it's an ongoing process. ASEAN is a darling now, I can say, from the queries I get, it's really a, a darling region, very attractive region for investors, diplomats, uh, all kinds of people because it's a corner of the globe that has an upward growth trajectory of five to six percent on average for the next five to ten years. This is uh, the most reliably fast-growing region in the world uh, at a time when global economic turbulence uh, is uh, unfolding. So a lot of promise here, a young market of 625 million people all combined with the largest Muslim country in Indonesia, the third largest democracy in the world in Indonesia. Uh, it's comp it comprises uh, the mainland countries, the maritime countries, uh, a lot around here, uh, a lot to play for, a lot to take into account. Uh, in addition, you know that the, the GDP, the combined GDP of ASEAN is 2.5 trillion. Um, it's really a, a region that uh, has many suitors. A lot of people pursue ASEAN. Uh, so we have the ASEAN community. I would imagine that in 1993, if you were sitting in Europe after they announced the Maastricht Treaty, the common market, it felt like, you know, it felt like a community. You can travel by train uh, from Germany to France, through Belgium, and so on. It was seamless. There was something about that integration. Around here, it's different. You can't really go by train from Indonesia to Thailand, uh, but we have low-cost airlines now. Uh, so different dynamics at play. It's not the kind of integration that you will see in Europe. It's a kind of uh, uh, the ASEAN way of connectivity that is a kind of integration that we will see around here. Um, and to tell us more, let me start with uh, the Director General of ASEAN. Uh, the Director General has a PhD from uh, the University of Southern California, um, Dr. Chakrit Siwali, and uh, he has been ambassador with the ministry. I can, you know, you have your, you have his CV, so I'm not going to go over his CV. I can only tell you that I'm, uh, from my Facebook, he has a lovely family. Um, so let him kick us off. Uh, tentatively, have, you know, the floor is yours. Where are we now? Do we have an ASEAN community, the ASEAN economic community? How should we think about it? How do we conceptualize and how do we feel? And what's, uh, what's up ahead? 
Thank you very much, Chan Tintinan. As a Chan Eight and Chan Tintinan have have observed, uh, ASEAN is very much a uh, work in progress, and uh, I myself woke up on the first of January feeling no different except for the hangover. Um, so what what is uh, well now now what now that the ASEAN community is upon us, we, we've been asking that question a lot within the ASEAN community ourselves, within uh, the, you know, among those of us who work directly with ASEAN, and I think that. Um, the the um, the key here to to is to temper our expectations so that they're realistic. I know that last year a lot of has been said to raise expectations and you know a lot of drumming up of uh, excitement on the upcoming ASEAN community, and then when the time came, hmm. So um, I think we need to understand what ASEAN is first of all, and then. Uh, and then as an outgrowth of ASEAN, what the ASEAN community can be and, and, and should be. First of all, ASEAN is not the EU. It has never aspired to be the EU. Um, it takes a different approach towards regional integration, uh, where the EU is uh, supranational. ASEAN has never aspired towards being a supranational authority. Uh, it's still firmly a state uh, member-driven uh, organization. And uh, while the EU is a customs union, ASEAN is merely a free trade area, and even that's still, um, you know, still a work in progress there as well. Uh, uh, on, on decision making, uh, ASEAN uh, uh, sticks steadfastly to the principle of uh, consensus, while the EU uh, uses for many of its uh, decisions uh, the principle of qualified majority voting, um, and. Uh, the EU also partially delegates some of its uh, the member states' uh, sovereign powers to the supranational authority that is the EU. While ASEAN would never dream, the ASEAN member states would never dream at this point anyway of doing that. It still uh, sticks uh, strictly to non-interference as a cardinal principle of ASEAN. That has served ASEAN well uh, in the past, and and for now that remains the case. Uh, the the uh, principles of consensus and non-interference uh, continue to uh, figure prominently uh, in determining the direction uh, that decisions in ASEAN will be made. Uh, so I think the, there I think I've, I've given a, a, a brief um, you know, picture of the aspirations of ASEAN, what it does not aspire to be. Now what, what can it be and what, it wants, what does it want to be? We have seen that um, the ASEAN documents tend to be quite uh, lofty in its goals. Uh, we have had the we have the ASEAN Charter, and we have the ASEAN Vision. Most uh, recently, the ASEAN Vision uh, 2025. Um, and these are good indications of what ASEAN aspires to be. But uh, whether ASEAN will achieve those aspirations quickly um, is something to be. You know, uh, well, we, we really can't say at this point because uh, the membership of ASEAN is so diverse in its um, cultural backgrounds, its uh, political and economic systems, language, uh, ethnicity, and then so um, using the principle of consensus, it can take quite a while to arrive at a decision on even, you know, simple matters. I'm probably the only um, executive of the ASEAN department who has never served at the ASEAN department before. And, you know, on a personal note, I just, um, the ASEAN department is, was the last place I wanted to serve at because I had attended their meetings. And uh, I could tell you that they're not very exciting. Um, they are quite um, detailed and they are very, they tend to get bogged down, you know, in, 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 in everything. And so it can take a while for ASEAN to arrive at a decision on, on anything. And, and if you want to reach consensus, that's even harder. So I just wanted to make sure that our expectations are, you know, realistic. Um, but ASEAN does have its uh, potential, it does have its strengths especially where uh, dealing with outside uh, 
threats or challenges are concerned. I think what made ASEAN's reputation was uh, its handling of the uh, Cambodia issue during the eight, 1980s. Um, I think that, that cemented ASEAN's reputation as an effective regional organization. Uh, pol political cooperation was the, the, uh, the, the first um, area of cooperation that gave ASEAN its um, uh, established ASEAN's reputation. And then it moved on to um, economic uh, cooperation with less success, but uh, it's still ongoing. We have um, uh, managed to eliminate or reduce the tariffs on, on most uh, goods now, although there remain the, the problem of uh, non-tariff barriers, which is uh, going to take some time, I believe. And we also need to uh, be, uh, talk about liberalizing. Uh, we are talking about liberalizing uh, trade and services uh, as well, and, and uh, investment and, and so on. But, but so far, uh, progress has been not as uh, fast as we would like. And on the, the third pillar, I think this is the most crucial in order for ASEAN to become a, a true community, the socio-cultural socio uh, socio uh, pillar. Uh, because when you're talking about a community, you're talking about the people. Do people feel a sense of community, or do they, do they feel that they're still citizens of their respective countries? You know, we've been talking about uh, we feeling, W-E, um, for a long time, and there's no, there hasn't really been uh, many good um, uh, solution or agreed solution on, on how we should approach this. Um, but I think that with the um, closer interaction that's uh, made possible by, you know, the freer flows of uh, people and uh, goods and services, uh, this, uh, this feeling, uh, this we feeling, may uh, arise uh, as a result, gradually, of course. Gra ASEAN is nothing if not gradual. It is always incremental, and uh, it never springs any surprises on people, which may be a good thing or a bad thing. Um, so that's why I think um, we didn't feel anything when the ASEAN community came into being, because it's been working on becoming a community for many years before that, and it's continuing to, to work on that. Uh, each country, each ASEAN member state, also has to prepare itself for becoming a community, for uh, the more open markets, uh, for the more liberal uh, flows of uh, people and goods and services. Um, so, so um, these are all uh, challenges, if you would, and that that would be would present some some uh, difficulty for for us in the in the short term. But in in the long term, I think we have uh, made a, a reasonably good attempt to stake out uh, the territory we want to uh, move on to during the next um, decade or so. Uh, with the ASEAN Charter and the uh, vision and blueprints of uh, 2025, I think the principles of ASEAN being, becoming a rules-based community, people-centered, people-oriented, inclusive, uh, these principles are, are set to change ASEAN uh, irrevocably if they are all uh, carried out. Um, I was giving, I gave a briefing the other day uh, at the Privy Council and I was asked what tangible changes uh, do you expect ASEAN to generate? And I could see that, of course, the AEC, which is uh, the most uh, talked about uh, community, would, uh, you know, once all the agreements are done, would have a, a tangible effect on all our lives. But the, the more, um, the more, uh, I think perhaps wide-reaching uh, impact would be made by the social-cultural um, pillar if uh, all uh, programs of cooperation are carried through and if all the action plans are, are carried out. Uh, the the um, I think the, the the key here is how do we manage change? ASEAN has been, you know, plodding along um, uh, slowly but uh, surely uh, since, 19, 16, since 1967, and it's had its share of successes, and, and uh, you know, so 
people tend to look to ASEAN as an example of a successful regional organization. But now ASEAN is at, at a crossroads because we are now changing from an organization that's always loosely based, always um, dependent on personal relationships among bureaucrats, among foreign ministers and uh, leaders. But now we are becoming people-centered. And what does people-centered mean? What are the implications of this word? Um, some, some member countries in ASEAN prefer the term people-oriented. And there is a kind of a you know, nuance there um, that, that is uh, quite uh, suggestive of where the positions lie. Uh, now, how do you take an organization that has uh, you know, been sort of a status quo oriented for so long and a top, top down driven for so long to a, an organization that is more inclusive, that in embraces the people at its center? So there has to be room for the public to participate more effectively in ASEAN. Uh, uh, that has, this is an only now beginning to, to happen. And for the past a few years, we have had a, uh, an annual uh, interface between ASEAN leaders and representatives of uh, various sectors, including the business sector, uh, young people, uh, uh, NGOs. Um, uh, per year, they have a total face time of 30 minutes. You know, if you want ASEAN to be more inclusive, you have to give them more time than that. But leaders are busy people. They don't have the time to, you know, spend... They, I, maybe they would like to have the time, but they, they don't, uh, realistically, realistically speaking, at the, the, the summits, which are busy enough in themselves, uh, to, to spend more time with the, the civil society. But that has probably got to change uh, if ASEAN has become more uh, people-centered and people-oriented. There is something called the ASEAN People's Forum, which uh, aggregates the, um, the wishes and the uh, complaints of uh, the, uh, the civil society and then channels them towards the um, ASEAN uh, process. I think this is the kind of um, linkage that we need to uh, strengthen, uh, and not at just the leader's level, but also at the working level, that which is where most of the work is being done. And uh, the, the issue of preparedness is something that has occupied the Thai government uh, uh, since uh, the last few years. Are we prepared for ASEAN? You know, some countries are not only prepared for ASEAN, but for the world. Uh, but we want to start small. Uh, are we prepared for ASEAN? This involves uh, upgrading our skills, especially in English language, you know, uh, uh, becoming more familiar with the ways of the world, how the world works. Uh, I think industry has made a good start. I think uh, they are aware of the upcoming uh, intensifying uh, competition uh, that will come with uh, the more open ASEAN, but the SMEs, the uh, the ordinary people, are in less of uh, are not in such a good position to to uh, adjust and to change and adapt to meet the uh, demands of ASEAN or to uh, make themselves uh, in a position to take full advantage of the ASEAN community. So uh, I think uh, we uh, countries in the in ASEAN, we'll need to uh, focus more on strengthening SMEs, uh, strengthening the capacity building for um, you know the general public, and uh, I think this people-centeredness will be a uh, key uh, condition for the success of the ASEAN community, because um, you know uh, if if ASEAN continues to to uh, be be Top down and to be driven by, by the state, uh, by, by by states, uh, it will not be in a um, position to um, uh, reflect the the wishes of the people, especially at a time when democracy is you know now all the rage. And um, in ASEAN itself, democracy and human rights are the words that we pay homage to, of course. Uh, but a lot of work has yet to be done, you know, you know on the ground and and, and in reality. Uh, it's a kind of a, you know, two steps forward to one step back process all the time. Uh, 
when we talk about uh, human rights and democracy, there are, there's always a few people in there who, you know, Thailand, uh, just for the record, uh, was the champion of the uh, for setting up the ASEAN Intergovernmental Commission on Human Rights, and we wanted uh, this uh, new body to uh, protect and promote human rights in ASEAN. But uh, so far, it has not been able to conduct its uh, protection functions, only its uh, promotion functions, uh, due to uh, I think the reluctance on part of the of some uh, member states. Uh, so, uh, when when ASEAN becomes a, truly a community. It'll not be enough to have an intergovernmental body to, to oversee human rights. I think you'll need to open up for the civil society itself to uh, be able to monitor and to, um, uh, to evaluate human rights and then feed this into the ASEAN process. I know I'm thinking, you know, far ahead. Uh, you might not have it in the next 10 years. Um, ASEAN is uh, slow moving, as I have said before. But I think these are some things that would uh, necessarily come about if we are to make an ASEAN a uh, truly, you know, people-centered uh, community. And I'll leave it at that for now, Ajahn. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Kappa and Liberty. Uh, let me just ask you a follow-up. You know, the frustration of organizing, discussing ASEAN is that uh, uh, there's a lot in it, but there's not much in it. It's very frustrating. You know, this year they have this ASEAN community. But things haven't really changed. Uh, so I think that one way to understand where we are is to look at the ASEAN genesis, the way that it was set up. It was never meant to be an integrated community as we know it in Europe. Uh, it never had the supranational dimension. It's all, you know, each to its own. It's intergovernmental at the end of the day. It's fundamentally intergovernmental. So I think that what the Director General, His Excellency, has mentioned Basically, you're saying that uh, to be a community, it has to be more people-centered, not just people-oriented. People-oriented uh, is, is favored by some members, like, uh, say, Cambodia, Laos, Vietnam, they say people-oriented. Uh, but the more democratic ASEAN members, they say people-centered. And Thailand still says that. Uh, Indonesia certainly says that. Uh, so that's uh, the, the nuance and the, the distinction. Now, I just want to ask a quick follow-up, uh, just so we can be... Uh, a bit more tangible and concrete, you know. This year, uh, has anything really changed? I mean, to me, ASEAN is more challenged. The pressure to deliver and perform is greater. It's divided from within in the South China Sea, you know, with China and the Philippines. It lacks leadership, the, the second office, uh, not as strong as the previous second. And then it has Laos now. Laos is the chair of ASEAN. And uh, Laos has its uh, challenges, uh, the lack of capacity and so on. So uh, at this time when ASEAN needs its capacity, its momentum the most, uh, it's more challenging and it doesn't have to, it does not have that momentum. Uh, and what do we do? You know, is this going to set ASEAN back? Um, so we, do you have any thoughts on uh, immediate challenge, the lack of momentum, lack of leadership, more divisions within uh, the major powers intervening? Well, I'm a diplomat, so uh, I maybe shouldn't comment on your point about lack of momentum and leadership. Uh, but, but no, uh, I think that um, I think all mem ASEAN member states are supportive of the uh, of Laos chairmanship, and we've been uh, doing everything, you know, we've been offering, uh, you know, to, to assist in any way we can, and uh, we are confident that uh, Laos will, uh, you know, carry out uh, its functions uh, with uh, uh, great style and panache. Um, on, on the issue of uh, the the, uh, the role of ASEAN's role versus vis-a-vis uh, -vis the superpowers, um, well, this has been the South China Sea has been on the table for a long time, several years now, and ASEAN has been uh, leading the process on uh, you know discuss on, on uh, consult consulting with China on resolving the issue. Uh, but it's not been easy because uh, China refuses to ne negotiate with ASEAN as ASEAN, but as 10 ASEAN member states. So uh, this means that uh, there is, that we, ASEAN cannot present an ASEAN draft, for example, of a paper, for example. So everything has to be s seen by all 11 member countries, 11 uh, c countries at the same time. As th this makes things difficult because you know, ASEAN, the idea of ASEAN is to, you know, the proverbial uh, rice stalks bound together into one you know, thick, um, you know, uh, 
um, strong um, stick. But uh, uh, when we on the South China Sea, this has not uh, been the case. Uh, ASEAN is divided among the um, the claimants and non-claimants. But I think that uh, ASEAN necessarily has to take has to avoid taking a position on the claims in the South China Sea. Um, ASEAN's position is that the South China Sea issues should be resolved by peaceful means um, through consultations and negotiations, negotiations, uh, and uh, you know through the uh, DOC process and the COC, that, and to avoid any uh, actions that would that may escalate or uh, aggravate the situation, to uh, ensure the freedom of navigation and overflight, and to uh, abide by uh, the principles of international law and uh, including the UNCLOS 19, 1982. So these are you know, general principles that all parties um, can agree to. But the interpretation of such things as UNCLOS, for example, has been a point of um, uh, contestation. Um, so so um, this is something that you know, is proceeding, seems to be proceeding on a, a dual track now. You have, on the one hand, diplomatic negotiations, which is proceeding and uh, which has made progress, although not tangible, um, in, the, in, the, in, term, in the sense that uh, we do have commitments to uh, come up with uh, early harvest mechanisms, such as uh, uh, hotlines between the foreign ministries and the search and rescue agencies. But th these have not been implemented yet because, uh, due to technical discussions, you know, uh, technical issues still in the way. Um, and now the COC is uh, finally being uh, discussed. We are still in the process of uh, putting issues in the basket, uh, difficult but crucial issues in the basket so that we can come up with a uh, uh, structure of uh, the elements in, in the uh, COC. Um, at the same time, on a separate track, on the ground or in the sea, you know, uh, developments continue apace. Um, so th I, I've, uh, in frustration, I've, uh, I've asked my uh, you know, Chinese uh, colleagues about this, and they, they admit that uh, the foreign ministry you know, is, not, is uh, constrained in what it can do. It can, does not have the authority to control the whole um, process of South China Sea. So you can sense that uh, in China itself, uh, there's, um, it's uh, you know, proceeding on two tracks. Um, the foreign ministry does not uh, does not have to say over what other ministries can or should do, um, and there are different opinions in China as well. There's a you know a, a streak of nationalism in the uh, discourse on the internet in China, and that uh, you know has implications for the uh, the the standing of the the party as well. So it's a it's a complicated issue for the Chinese as well as for for ASEAN. And, and, and ASEAN, I think, is doing its level best to, to, to ensure that, uh, you know, at least in the, the diplomatic track, that uh, we do achieve the COC in a reasonable time. We, we, we wanted an early resumption, early conclusion of, of the COC. It's not been early so far, um, but um, we hope that, uh, you know, inshallah, that uh, we'll have it this year under uh, Singapore's um, able coordinatorship. Okay, thank you very much. You know, when we feel frustrated, we can think that uh, there has never been a worse time, there's never been a worse time not to have ASEAN in Southeast Asia. Um, let me turn now to uh, my friend and colleague, uh, Ajahn Kitti, Professor Sukhov. Uh, he's the director of the Institute of East Asian Studies uh, at Thammasat University. He has a PhD from Berkeley, and he is Thammasat's foremost expert on, uh, on ASEAN and East Asia Asian Studies. Ajahn Kitti. Thank you, Titinan. Uh, my pleasure to be here uh, speaking to you. Uh, let me start with, uh, I, I would like to introduce Ambassador Jacqueline a little bit, because um, um, he's one of his fan club. He's a songwriter. He's a songwriter. We, we, we don't know the soft side of him. I, I was in a concert uh, a few months ago. <laughs> he also presented at the concert. He, he wrote many good songs. But I'm, I'm sure he doesn't have time to write any more songs after taking up the Director General at ASEAN Department. Anyhow, uh, I think I have uh, maybe four points for section of my talk today. 
uh, on the first point, I think uh, I will talk about the, the perceptions of the people on ASEAN. There are two uh, conflicting trends. One trend is that people tend to overestimate about ASEAN, particularly those in Thailand, people in Thailand. Another trend is to underestimate about ASEAN. Uh, for those who overestimate about ASEAN, uh, particularly in Thailand, I don't know if it is the case in Indonesia, we can share later on, but in Thailand, many people have a very high expectation, very high hope on ASEAN community uh, because we don't have uh, many models or examples on uh, regional integration. We have only EU as the ideal type of uh, regional integration. Therefore, uh, many people, at least in Thailand, uh, have the perception that Thailand will become very much like EU. More free movement of people, movement of trade, goods, uh, capital, and so on. But later on, I think, uh, like uh, Dean Egg has mentioned, nothing much has changed uh, after the new year, after we enter the ASEAN community, which is, I think, in fact, it is predictable from the first place because uh, Ambassador Jacket also mentioned, I mean, ASEAN is not expired to be like uh, the European Union. We still have a lot of limitation. We still uh, have uh, border issue problem and, and so on, a sovereignty problem. We still stick to the non-interference principle. Uh, I myself uh, wrote an article in Bangkok Business newspaper early this year, uh, last month, early uh, the first week of, of January. My article is titled Heartbroken from ASEAN. Heartbroken from ASEAN, but it, uh, sorry, it is in Thai. Uh, I, I argue that uh, Thai people will be very much uh, heartbroken because they have expected too much about ASEAN. Uh, but ASEAN uh, has not delivered what they might have expected. Uh, on the free flow of labor, free flow of uh, goods, free flow of capital. Uh, I think uh, Thai people, most of them have the image of a uh, European Union that once we become community, we can travel to other country more freely, uh, like from France to Germany to Germany to Austria, you do not need to have a passport check. But in ASEAN, things are uh, different. So I think most Thai people now they become aware that uh, things that they have expected might not be. So uh, we have to wait for a long while until we can reach that community. Uh, another thing that Thai people tend to uh, overestimate about ASEAN or misunderstood about ASEAN is the free flow of labors. Uh, in general, when you talk to Thai people, they will say that, oh, uh, there will be a more influx of labor, migrant labor from neighboring countries. But the thing is that they have been in Thailand already. I mean, the labor we need has been in Thailand already a long time ago. So nowadays, I think we have had about uh, 3 million. About 2.6 has been registered with the Ministry of Labor. But in, in reality, there might be more than that, maybe 3 million plus. Therefore, we, we have uh, migrant labor that we need already. Uh, so overall, I think there is a misunderstanding about uh, ASEAN by agreement, by state agreement, intergovernmental state agreement, or ASEAN by market mechanism. ASEAN by market mechanism. In fact, ASEAN community has been driven by market mechanism rather than uh, agreement, in my opinion. Because what, what has been connecting ASEAN, I think uh, most of the part we have to thank for FDI, foreign direct investment from Japan, from Taiwan, uh, from Western country, and create the kind of production networks in the region. So intra-industry trade has been uh, prevalent in, in ASEAN. So the increasing of, of trade in ASEAN, we have to look at the uh, foreign capital, I mean, the, the trade of uh, foreign uh, investment uh, that has been extensive in ASEAN. It's become production network, supply chains, 
uh, within uh, the region. Uh, let me go to the trend to underestimate ASEAN. Many critics always criticize ASEAN of being talk shop, not delivering anything, or uh, they keep talking, they keep talking, and, and a lot of problem on implementation deficit. That is, you have a lot of plan, you have a blueprint, but uh, the, the blueprint that the implementation rate may be only 30%, 20%, and so on. Uh, but I think we have to appreciate ASEAN a bit in the past several years. Uh, with the ASEAN community, I think at least we have some achievements. Achievement. For example, uh, what is the important change at the end of the year when we enter the ASEAN community? I think the first thing is the tariff reduction in CLMV countries. Tariff reduction, because it has been completed at the end of the year, 2015. But for the older members, six member ASEAN countries, it has been implemented, completed uh, since the early 2010, becoming in effect since 2010. But for CLMV, uh, Cambodia, Myanmar, Laos, uh, Cambodia, Laos, Myanmar, and Vietnam, we have to wait for them a little bit. Therefore, uh, it has been the process of tariff reduction has been completed at the end of 2015. Secondly, there are some uh, visa exemptions, visa exemption for, for ASEAN nationals to country like Myanmar, which has been quite uh, closed until uh, a few years ago. Cambodia also uh, exempt visa for Thai citizens. So that is a kind of positive trend among ASEAN member countries that they are open up uh, for, for each other. So travel to each country can be uh, done more easily. And also thanks to the low-cost airline that uh, enable people to travel uh, more in expensively. Third, on a single window, single window, single window system. This has been planned, this has been agreed upon since 2008. US USAID also uh, contributed to this in terms of studies, advice, giving us advice, uh, make a survey on preparedness, and so on. The single window will enable uh, trade to facilitate trade to be done more uh, easily in terms of a single stop, one stop service, and also uh, more simplified documentation, more simplified documentation. But this has not been completely done yet. I mean, it's still the work in progress, but we cannot discount uh, the progress we, we have some we have some some progress but we still have to to work to work on uh, to make them more uh, to work the system uh, more uh, practical and more effective the single window system why we we have not completed fully I think uh, all the country most of the country in ASEAN member countries we have the problem of integration among agency integration among government agencies. It is a classic, very classic problem, not only in ASEAN country. In any country, you have bureaucracy. Uh, they tend to be vertically oriented, vertically integrated. They do not work horizontally. That is a classic problem, and ASEAN also. Uh -huh. And another thing what has been done is on connectivity, connectivity. Uh, maybe not, not much satisfied yet, but we work, we have been working on connectivity, mostly in mainland ASEAN, unfortunately, not much in, in maritime ASEAN. In Indonesia, the country itself has a problem of connectivity, you have so many islands. So connectivity has been the issue of uh, mainland, mainland ASEAN. So the project on, on, on train uh, by the Chinese, by the Japanese has been uh, going on. Uh, so it, it's a positive trend, at least, that we will have more physical uh, connectivity. And when we link with single window, that means connectivity uh, degree will be increasing in, in, in Asia. Uh, and one thing that we have to be aware, like I said earlier, much connectivity, much uh, integration in ASEAN have been done by actors outside ASEAN like Japanese investment, 
Taiwanese investment, Western investment, and also this kind of Chinese investment in terms of infrastructure, in terms of train, uh, road, the contribution from the ADB, Asian Development Bank, uh, in the Greater Mekong Sub-Region project, which has started more than 20 years ago. But now, what to be done? What to be done? Maybe we have a longer list of what we have achieved. Uh, as Ambassador Jackley has said, now we still work in progress. Work in progress. We still have to work out uh, many things. We have to continue our efforts in linking ASEAN uh, together. But what ASEAN is tend to be uh, in the shortcoming is on evaluation. Evaluation. Uh, if you take a look at AEC scorecard, which has been released uh, a few years back, they tend to evaluate very broadly that the country has adopted the measure, adopted the policy or not. They do not look into the implementation or results. They look at, the, oh, the, the government has ratified the agreement, the government has started the policy, but did not look very deeply into implementation. I think that is the, the problem of ASEAN, that we need to, to look at the issue more squarely uh, rather than uh, try to, oh, we have good, location, good relation, we have done this, we have done that, but never look into the detail uh, what actually has been done or not. Okay, uh, I think the, in, uh, the integration has to be continued. What has to be done, I think it's very easy to look at the theme of the, uh, the Laos government has put up on the ASEAN summit this year, on uh, the host ASEAN this year, with the theme, turning vision into reality. Turning vision into reality. I think ASEAN also came to accept that we have so many visions, but it's the time that we really put it into reality. We must realize much of our visions. Um, so that means, now we have a very really large gap, large gap of vision and reality, vis uh, vision and implementation. Uh, if we take a look at uh, AEC 2020 blueprint, in fact, ASEAN Economic Ministerial Meeting recently in Malaysia, they issued the AEC 2020 blueprint. They emphasize uh, five components, five components. First, highly integrated and cohesive economy. They put the, the term highly. Highly, that means we, we have been integrated, but we have to put it to a new ground, level up into a more highly integrated economy. Secondly, competitive, innovative, and dynamic ASEAN. The new term that has come here is innovative. It just, it just, it just the only competitive, but now innovative. Third, I think it's very important, resilient, inclusive, people-oriented, people-centered. Uh, this term is new. It's not in the AEC blueprint for the first place, in, in the first version, but now uh, they try to incorporate people into the picture of the AEC. Uh, fourth, enhance sectoral integration and cooperation. So we have to move uh, more into sectoral level rather than just broad macro level of integration. We have to look closely into each sector. And I think we should come up with some priority sector as well. Fifth, global ASEAN. Global ASEAN. This term has been used uh, before by Indonesia, ASEAN community and the global community. So ASEAN want to be uh, a part or an important part in the global economy uh, in the world. So uh, work in progress, still going on on the AEC. But my last point here from, from this presentation first is on the chart coming very much on ASCC, the ASEAN Socio-Cultural Community. I think this pillar has been much left behind, left behind. AEC is the leading uh, pillar, of course, then followed by APSC, ASEAN Political Security Community. But the ASCC, the ASEAN Social Cultural Community, I think this, this pillar uh, has not made much progress, uh, partly because ASEAN also em always emphasize on economic first, 
and also ASEAN in many countries do not put people as the high priority. Uh -huh. And also in terms of uh, cooperation on socio-cultural issues, we have several ministries, not only in Thailand, in other countries as well. So it, it's very hard to find uh, the host in the ASCC, and somehow the integration in country itself has not been uh, well enough to accelerate the process of ASEAN social-cultural community. So I think I saved the APSC for, for the next round. Thank you.